You are on to a life transforming experience as Pastor Prince Abba brings you God's word with deep insight and power. God bless you. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Uh, once again, I want to thank God for this um, glorious opportunity to be here this morning. I uh, thank God for you know all the beautiful faces I see here. Um, it's a privilege to be here once again, especially because I'm talking to young people who have their future ahead of them and who God is raising to do mighty things for him. I want to thank God very specially for, you know, Pastor Prince. He's a good man. He's a good man, you know, and um, he's somebody you should celebrate. Somebody you should celebrate. At least since I came to Abakliki, you know, that's how many years now? When I first came to Abakliki, you know, yes, it was the first time I came to Abakliki. Um, when I met you about four or five years ago, something like that, you know, uh, he's been an exceptional person, someone who I hold very dearly, you know, and um, I want you to know that, and I want you to know that. Hmm? Yeah. So please put your hands together for him one more time. Yeah. Yeah. God bless you. God bless you. You may be seated. So I am here under the grace of my father, the anointing of the servant of God, the apostle to this generation, Pastor David Obueli. Uh, uh, I just I just spoke with him this morning. Spoke with him this morning and um even after having known him for 22 years, I followed him for 22 years, 1996 to now, you know, every single opportunity I have to listen to him, to talk to him, to either get instructions or to get directions, are very, very sacred opportunities for me. I learn a lot, you know, even from instructions he gives, even the way he gives the instructions, I learn from them. You know, so, uh, so you see, um, learning is an ever continuous process, and that's why we place a lot of emphasis on you know trainings and all that. You know, so um, I bring you greetings from him, and uh, I want you to realize that the best of you is yet to come. Can I hear somebody say Amen? amen. Can I hear louder? Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay. So, um, let me use the time I have to share something with you. There's something I will tell you. I will tell you something. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to you about the ways to gain value before God. I don't know if those things entered at all. Uh, that are the ways to gain value before God, you know. Um, is that the number of things, you know, but it's not everything I finished saying. Uh, Aura Roberts wrote a beautiful book. Like I told you, I, lo- I love biographies, I love autobiographies. So he wrote a, an autobiography. I have about two autobiographies written by him. You know, an autobiography is when the man writes himself. Uh, so the biography is when he's written about. You know, I also have biographies, of him, but I, I place more value on his autobiographies. And there's something he said in his autobiography that has become my guiding philosophy. That autobiography, I first laid hands on it about 12 years ago, and I read it back to back, finished and read it again. I read it, I think, the third time, because what is inside there was just too much. The book is titled "Expect a Miracle." by Aura Roberts, a black book that showed him in front. It's a big book. He was laying hands on somebody. Aura Roberts said something I will never forget. Aura Roberts said his mother called him. And she laid hold on him. I said to him, Aura, 
And he answered her. And she said to him, two things. Number one, always believe God for big things. I noted that. Always believe God for big things. You see, when I was thinking about that statement, I realized something. It dawned on me. I had realized it before, but it dawned on me even further. You see, that your miracle is not dependent on God. Let me say it again so you can hear what I'm saying. Let it get into you very well. You're not going to ever find anywhere in the Bible where the Bible says your miracle is dependent on God. It's not dependent on God. Let me tell you what your miracle is dependent on. Let me say it this way. You determine your capacity. Your capacity determines your miracle. Study the Bible. You find it everywhere you find it. In Psalm 81, I think verse 10, God said, open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. So you see, wide is relative. What is wide for you might not be wide for you. So what you define as wide is what God will fill. With is not dependent on God. With is dependent on you. You study the entire Bible. You keep on seeing the same thing over and over again. You know, you know, you know, if you ask someone to take a bite of an apple now, if I give you an apple now, I say bite, take a big bite. You know, I have, for example, I have a two year old son, my last kid. I asked my two year old son to take a big bite. You know that big bite? You know how big the big bite will be now? He has not finished exercising his jaws, so the jaw might not even spread very well. He'll just take a small bite. Some of you here now, if I ask you to take a big bite, Depending on how hungry you are and how much, you know, forming. You know, somebody might be forming. You know, she doesn't want to stain her lipstick. She doesn't want to seem to, you know, she doesn't want to do anything that is not uh, in tune with propriety. So what she will now take is a little, just take a big, her big bite, just open her mouth and just kiss the apple and say that she has taken a bite. There are some other guys who have to take a big bite. As she surrender the apple, you need to be careful about your hand. Because that apple, your hand might just follow the apple. Somebody hear what I'm talking about now. So it, it, capacity, it depends on different people. It's capacity. I, I, am I communicating here? So God fills your capacity. How do I know? I can show you throughout the Bible. It's all over the Bible. It's all over the Bible. Elijah asks a woman, who doesn't have enough money to pay her bills? What do you have in the house? She says, I have only a cruise of oil. He says, go and borrow from your neighbors. Empty gallons, empty containers. And he said to her, borrow not a few. She goes and borrows everything she has. And the Bible says, she locked herself up because Elijah gave that instruction. She locked up herself with her son. And then, you see, because that's very important. You need to shut away naysayers. Shut away traducers. Shut away people that don't believe in what you're doing. Shut them out. Only walk inside with people that have imbibed the vision. So, you see, she carried her son, who understood the situation, locked herself in the room, and began to pour into people's vessels. And the Bible says the moment she poured into the last one, the oil stopped. You see, so if she had a hundred more vessels, she would, keep, she would have kept on pouring. If she had a thousand more vessels, she would have kept on pouring. That's the way it is. It's your capacity that determines your harvest. So, but Robert's mother said to him, believe God for big things. You know, for me, small things are an abomination. I cannot believe God for small things. I don't hang around small people. I don't let them hang around me. Because mediocrity is infectious. You know what I'm talking about? I don't, I don't do that. I don't do that. There are some things I don't watch. <laughs> I understand that, you know, Nollywood movies are getting better now. You know, back in the days, if you see the kind of things they used to produce then, those things were detrimental to my IQ, so I never used to watch them. I never used to watch them. I watched one particular one one day where the guy's wife, the, the guy's elder brother, you know, incidentally, I think it was in Kemo Wood that was acting that part. It was a younger brother. So the guy's elder brother, you know, uh, he was targeting 
the guy. He wanted to take, take away the things that belonged to him. He was working hard to take away. He and his wife, his diabolical wife, were working hard to take away the things that belonged to him. So along the line, I think they killed him. They took off his things. But you see, what struck me the most was a flashback. There was one flashback they did. They did a flashback to 19, I think it was 1990. 1990 or something like that. Because it was about 15 years ago, they did a flashback. I, don't, I just stumbled on that thing. The moment I stumbled on that, that so-called movie, I, I began to repent for even seeing that kind of thing. It's, it did a flashback, 1990. And lo and behold, somebody drove into, in 1990, someone drove into a compound with a 2005 Jeep. In 1990. A 2005 Land Cruiser. The guy drove in 1990. Even if your bank PHB that saw the future, how are you able to do that? It's in Hollywood you see where a ghost, ghost wants to cross the road. He will look right, look left. So that... Eh? Can you imagine that kind of thing? Somebody goes to New York, enters inside a hotel. He's talking to the receptionist. The receptionist is talking to him in New York. Behind, you see the picture of Fashion Land, Good Luck, Jonathan. In a hotel in New York. I said, I'm not watching again. There's no need. What's the point? Because you see, the things you keep before you have a way of turning. You, you know what I'm talking about? No, no, no. I'm not careless about anything I keep around me. I'm not careless about it. There's nothing I will ha- have around me that will not inspire me. Nothing. For example, you know, when I come inside a place, for example, one of the things I first of all look at is the lighting system. You know, I came in, uh, first thing I asked him, please, I need these lights on. Do you have your lights on? I cannot stay inside a room where the walls are not white and the lights are not white because illumination helps me. I don't stay in dark places. I don't stay in places that, you know, you, you, need, you need to know what works for you, know what inspires you. I don't manage anything that is not that. I can manage another thing you give me, but manage anything that will begin to affect my inspiration. It's not possible. I can't do that. Because I've learned to believe God for big things. A, a, a Japanese proverb says, don't, he said, employ big people. Employ people that have big minds. Don't employ people that have small minds. Because small minds cause big problems. That cost that will produce that will end up being solved with big money. So you need to get people that have big minds. That's the way it works. So the woman said, "Believe God for big things." I want someone here to be able to challenge God. When I say challenge, I don't mean one God. I mean you know, release your faith and see yourself bigger than where you are presently. Put something in front of you that will inspire you and cause you to make progress. Am I communicating here? Okay, in whatever form of leadership you're doing, don't give God anything that's man. God doesn't like managing. Whatever should be done should be done well. Have an attitude of excellence, have a mentality, because that's the way God functions. Don't be a disorderly person. Challenge God with big things in your eyes, big ideas, big visions, big dreams. Nothing is wrong with having a big dream. If you're willing to start small. The challenge is when you now have a big dream. You're not ready to start small. You want to now jump inside it. That's not the way it works. Or Robert's mother now looked at him and said. The second thing that really struck me. And I noted that one. Of course I note all of them. She said. Believe God for big things. And number two. Always remain small in your own eyes. Always remain small. In your own eyes. You know, don't on me that nothing is wrong go, with being big in people's eyes as long as you're small in your own eyes. Nothing is wrong with that. Because when you even study the life of David, you study the Bible, you notice something. They were singing David's praises, singing David's praises. They sang the guy into javelins. <laughs> All those women were busy singing, they sang him into assassination attempts. Javelins were flying left, right, and center because Saul now became offended. But I checked David's attitude throughout the time. It's something that really struck me. You know, if you study the Bible, the Bible says David was promoted by Saul. Let me show you. Let me show you something here. Um, 
And this should be your mantra. Should be your philosophy. Should be your life. Should be everything about you. Let me show you something. Open your Bibles to First Samuel. Chapter 18. This is after David killed Jonathan, um, killed Goliath. Watch this. So the women sang verse 7 of First Samuel, Samuel chapter 18. Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? You see, a leader's most important trait, write what I'm saying in capital letters, a leader's most important trait, his most important asset, is not his vision, is not his ability to communicate, is not his skill or his anointing. A leader's most important trait is his sense of security. Once you are secure on the inside, it doesn't matter what any other person is doing around you. It will not shake you. Somebody hear what I'm talking about? A sense of insecurity made Saul consider his biggest asset as his biggest liability. He turned David, that was his biggest asset, to a liability. He started trying to kill the guy that took out his Goliath. The guy that could have won many more wars for him. Because people were praising David more than they were praising him. But see what happened. What I'm interested in now is in David, not even Saul. I can give you so many things about Saul and Saul's style of leadership and things you should learn not to learn from Saul. So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Verse 9. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit of God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside the house. And so David played music with his hand as at other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand. Watch this. Saul cast the spear. For he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and had departed from Saul. Now watch this. Verse 13. In fact, even before we go to verse 13, just hold that verse 13. Let's go back to Let's actually start from verse 1. Let me show you verse 1. Then we'll go down to verse 13. Let me show you something. Verse 1. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Verse 2. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. And then Jonathan and David made a covenant, verse 3, because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword, and his bow, and his belt. Verse 5. So David went out wherever Saul sent him, and he behaved wisely. Everyone say, he behaved wisely. I want to hear your voice. Everyone say, he behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. He had favor with Saul. He had a position. He was promoted. The Bible says he behaved himself wisely. When he lost favor with the man who he was serving, not for any fault of his, because he was still doing what he was doing, he got demoted. See what happened. Verse 13. Verse 13. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. You know, this was the same person that he had set above all the men of war. Now he reduced him, demoted him, made him a captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. But look at verse 14. Let's read it together. I want to go. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. So you promote the man, the attitude is consistent. You demote him, the attitude is consistent. Nothing changed. You see, one of the true tests of character is in your response to external situations, to a stimulus that comes from outside. What happens? Are you the kind of person that wilts under pressure? What changes? Does your loyalty change? Your pastor praises you. Pastor Prince comes and praises you, says all kinds of wonderful things about you. How about when he stops praising you, what happens? 
Does it affect your attitude to work? Does it affect your commitment? Because if you are serving God because of a man, then you're not actually serving God. If you are serving God because of a man, then you're not actually serving God. You can serve God by serving a man. But if you serve God because of a man, you're not serving God. Is that clear? So you need to check what your own attitude is. So, our Robert's mother said to him, always remain small in your eyes. So that has become my own guiding philosophy. You see, you need to understand the difference between confidence and arrogance. Confidence is an assertion of your self-worth. Arrogance is an exaggeration of your self-worth. You need to know the balance and know where you stay in the middle. Because humility is not talking down on yourself. Eh? Humility is not talking down on yourself. You see, Paul said in the Romans, to Romans, the Roman Christians, he said, you know, by the grace given unto me, I say unto each one of you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. In other words, you should think of yourself highly. Except don't think of yourself more highly. Think of yourself within proportion. Think of yourself within the context of who God has created you to be. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about here? Humility is actually impossible without confidence. Genuine humility. You can't have that talking down on yourself. Self-deprecation, talking down. No, you can't. You need to see yourself within the context in which God sees you, but don't see yourself beyond it. Am I communicating here? Okay. So, one of the first things we need to examine is our attitude to leadership, our attitude to God, our attitude to leadership God has placed under us or placed us under. How do we respond to corrections? How do we respond? You know, how committed are we? What are those things we do? How do we view the men that God has placed above us? What kind of interactions do we have with them? What kind of reverence do we have? What's our attitude towards them? These things are very important. They're very important. Anyway, I want to talk to you this morning about the sevenfold price of discipleship. When you have to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, what does it require? Okay, Matthew chapter 16. Um, okay, before you get there, let's read Luke chapter 14. Hmm? Luke chapter 14 from verse 25. Luke chapter 14 from verse 25. Luke chapter 14 from verse 25. Okay. See what the Bible says here. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, Wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You know, he's not talking about, he's not saying you should hate your, fa- your family. It means by comparison. If you place your family on one hand, you place Jesus Christ on one hand, you know, the level of affection you have for God and for his work by comparison should look like, you know, it should so far outweigh what you have for your parents and affiliations you have to your family, that it can even be considered hatred. It doesn't mean you hate them physically. No, that's not what it's saying. That's the way the Bible, in, you know, translators interpreted that part. That's how the way they translated it, but that's not literally what he was saying. But anyway, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Uh, maybe you should put that place up for me in the Amplified Translation. Put it up in the Amplified Translation. Uh, Start with verse 26. Verse 26 in the Amplified Translation. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother in the sense of indifference to or relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude toward God. Can you see that now? So in comparison with his attitude toward God, your passion for God should be so far superior to these other ones that it can be considered indifference or disregard. Not that you should disregard your family or hate them. That's not what he's saying. 
And likewise, his wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So Jesus is talking about discipleship here. Verse 27. Verse 27. Whoever does not persevere and carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay, let's continue. Verse 28. You can go back to the New King James. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake. Someone say forsake. Someone say forsake. So whosoever of you that does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Okay. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, from verse 32. Let me show you. He said the same thing, but there are different things that he said the same thing in a different way. There are different things he picked out here. I want to be able to show, pick them out so you can see. From verse 32, Matthew chapter 10. And he said, yeah, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him, I will confess. I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother, more than me, is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter, more than me, is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me, is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Okay, finally, let me just give you one more. Matthew chapter 16, from verse 24. Because the scriptures I'm now calling out will throw more light on exactly what Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33 actually means. <coughs> so, Matthew 16, from verse 24. And Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the entire world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So give me that portion of scripture in the Amplified Translation. Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Do you have verse 24 on your laptop? And Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to be my disciple, watch this now. This is now I'm going to break this down for you so you see. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself. It doesn't mean to deny yourself. Put a disclaimer over your head. Have you ever picked up the newspaper and you see disclaimer? Mr. Peter Jumbu was once an employee of XYZ Company. We now state officially that he no longer works for us. Anyone who does business with him does so at his own risk. That's a disclaimer. So, so and so, Mr. So and so and so of so and so village, you know, used to be my son. But I have now put a disclaimer over him because of so so and so and so. He's no longer my son and he forfeits every right to inheritance from my family. Have you seen such things before? That's disclaimer. It's like saying that you are not qualified to be a disciple of Jesus Christ if you do not put a disclaimer over your head. Whoever used to know me as so so and so person in the past, you related with me on that basis. 
you cannot relate with me on that basis anymore. You know, Paul said, we used to know people after the flesh. But henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. There's something he was saying there. What does that mean? Really, what does that mean? Look at this. He said, if anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interests. Can you see that? And take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me and conform wholly, conform totally to my example in living and if need be in dying as well. Look at the next verse, verse 25. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life, his blessed life in the kingdom of God? For what would a man give as an exchange for his blessed life in the kingdom of God? Verse 27. Did you give me 25? Did we read verse 25? We didn't read verse 25. You have a very trigger happy person on that. Listen now. Why, why is there any reason you keep jumping it? Who is the man? Which, which, which one of you three? Let me see the person I'm talking about. Now. Is there any reason you keep jumping it? Okay. Let's read verse 25. Let's read it together. One to go. For whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, his comfort and security here shall lose it. That's eternal life. And whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here, for my sake, shall find it life everlasting. Okay. Sevenfold price of discipleship. In order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, what is required? Number one, self-denial. What is self-denial? Self-denial is shifting away, shoving away your ambition. Placing aside your will. That's what self-denial is. Moving away your ambition. You see, one of the ways you can tell what an ambition is is that you see, a genuine vision comes from God. Hmm? An ambition is your product. A genuine vision revolves around others, lifting others, empowering others. An ambition revolves around you, lifting you, empowering you, setting you above every other person. A genuine vision will cause you to bend in order to rise. An ambition implements its own agenda for you to rise alone. That's how ambitions work. So you want to know the difference between what God is telling you and what God is telling or what your flesh is telling you. Anything your flesh tells you is for your promotion, for your self-gratification, to entice you, to make you feel good. Anything God is telling you is for the benefit of other people. In many cases, what God will tell you will not be convenient for your flesh. In fact, 99.9999% of the time, whatever God tells you is not comfortable for you. Because you see, one of the ways to know when God is t- talking to you is this. If God tells you something, that thing that God is telling you will put a demand on your potential. Number two, if God tells you something, that thing God is telling you will require you to seek him in order for it to be fulfilled. Anything that God tells you that you can do by yourself, God is not involved in. Anything that God tells you, supposedly tells you to do, that does not need you to consult him for its execution, God is not involved in. Anything that God supposedly tells you to do, that revolves around you alone and ends up ultimately for only your promotion to the detriment of everybody around you, God is not involved in. There is nothing that God will give you that is not meant to benefit others. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing that God will tell you that is not geared towards empowering others. Eventually, will it empower you? Yes. If you remember what I said yesterday, three dimensions of the work of the Holy Spirit, he works in you first. After working in you, he now works through you. In his working through you, he's empowering others. And on the basis of what he has done through you for others, he now does for you. That's the way it works. You don't put self-gratification first. You don't put your ambition first. 
You don't put what you, you what you stand to gain first. You know, when I started ministry, when, we be, when I first became a pastor, I did not realize, I did not know that a pastor was supposed to even get anything. I'm telling you the truth. I didn't know a pastor was even supposed to get anything. I did not know anything about that. Back in those days, I didn't, we didn't used to see all those, you know, it was a relatively, you know, recent thing in a sense. Because 20 something years ago, you will not see any man of God moving around with convoys. Convoys up and down. Cars and, you know, siren and all those things. We didn't see any of those things. So that was not even our motivation in the first place. You know, when, 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 when Paul said what he said, that he who desires the office of the bishop desires a good work, you need to understand the context in which he was saying it. Nowadays, anybody can desire the office of a bishop. But what was Paul talking about? To be a bishop in those days was to sign your death warrant. Because the Roman authorities were out for everybody. They catch Christians, they will kill them. What would they do to the leaders? Imagine what they would do to the leaders. Paul said in that, at that position, they are looking for you to kill you. He says if you desire the office of a bishop, you desire a good work. Because this thing is not about ambition. It's not about wearing the suits, driving the jeeps, traveling up and down, having convoys, having bodyguards everywhere. That's what people have turned it to. That's an abuse of the gospel. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? That's not what Jesus Christ came to do. Now, are those things necessary? Possibly. But they are a means and not the end. There are people who now turn those things to the end. You want to wear suit and drive big cars and all those things. As if when you get to heaven, Jesus Christ is going to ask you how many cars you had to be qualified to enter inside the kingdom of God. No. This thing has always been about people. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about here? God has always sent us to empower people, to impact people, to submit our wills, to lay everything down. That's the first thing, self-denial. The first thing I, I had to, I, I keep on telling pastors around me is I keep on asking them, find out what is the reason you entered into ministry? Why did you an, answer the call? Did God call you or did your stomach call you? Which one called you? There's some people that, like I was saying yesterday, some people have the call, they don't have the calling. I'm sure you've seen a number of people like that. Say that I have a call of God. I'm not saying you should go and start criticizing or looking at anybody. God didn't give you that gift. Grace, he says, I, I have the grace of discernment. There's nothing like that. So I can discern bad men and good men. Stay where you are. Stay on your track. Don't go and start judging. Say, hey, yes, I've always thought that that bishop, Boju Boju there, I, I suspected that that guy is not born again. When he preaches, the way he does his eye like this. I said, hey, this, guy, this guy cannot be saved. That's not what we're talking about. Stay or work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Leave others. You're not the assistant Holy Ghost. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Some people immediately just believe that they are, they are deputy lamb of sacrifice. Nobody made you that. <laughs> Nobody made you that. So, there's some people that come and say, I, I call. You have to be sure about the call of God. There's some people that claim that they are called, called by God. God did not even flash them, not even talk about call. He didn't send them text messages and say, call. Which call? What's the call of the call? Which, what did he used to call them? MTN or GLOW? Nothing. They don't know. Ambition. Paul spoke about such people. He said there are people that preach for different reasons. Some preach to advance the gospel. Some even were preaching to add cheap bonds to Paul. He said some were preaching for their, for their own personal gratification for what they could get. There are people like that everywhere. Now you should be very clear about it. Lay everything down. If we're serving God, we're serving God. Your own ambition goes to the ground. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about here? You see that thing that Pastor Bright was saying in Patakos? When he said it, somebody came to my mind because I, I take note of such things. When you, you see, I don't, know if it's, I don't even know if it's Pastor Bright that was saying or, or the Dr. James uh, from America. Well, he was talking about um, you know, having a schedule. I think it's Dr. James. Servants have a schedule. Sons lay, all, lay their time, lay everything down. Servants have a schedule. They know, okay, within this time, this time, I'm supposed to be here, I'll do and I'll go. Yeah, everything about them is they want to live very fast, you know. 
as he was saying it, I remembered somebody. I won't say anything. You know who I'm talking about. I won't give any further clues. We were in a meeting, a pastor's meeting like this. I had a book, incidentally, written by this man. And, you know, he took that book from me, opened it, and what he was reading, the first page, the man was talking about the time, time, time allotted for different things. There's time to pursue the vision of God. The time to open doors. You need to know how to maximize the time. But he, the way he read it, he was reading it, that it was time for him to, that he could not remain in Dominion City for, you know who I'm talking about, if, if you can think about the person now. Uh-huh. Shortly after that, you know, you, you know, uh-huh, you know uh-huh. shortly after that, that was how he took off and, uh, you know, that was, that was, because I, every, I remember those periods, interactions I had with him, he was always talking about time, 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 time to go where, time to do what. Time to do what? I've known several pastors like that. There's a friend of mine who was a pastor in the ministry that left. I'm not saying that it's wrong to leave, but if you let this be God that's guiding you, follow the leading of the Spirit and do it properly. There's not there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing. But follow the leading of God and do it properly. This guy kept on talking about my vision, my vision, my plan, my dream. Who are campus pastors? I won't call his name just in case anybody here might know him. He's a geo now, running his own ministry in Lagos. He's been running that ministry for the past 15 years. Yes. We're on campus together, pastoring. I was pastoring one of our chapters on campus in UNN. He was pastoring one of our chapters as well. Incidentally, I became a pastor before him. But then, you know, you come for prayer meetings like these people gather in prayer meetings. Corporate prayer meetings. We have we used to have corporate prayer meetings in long tennis courts. So the pastor over the fellowship then, many years ago, because we had several fellowships, NCF fellowships, and then we had an overseer, a coordinator. The coordinator will call combined services every now and then. One of those days I saw this, my friend, his people were busy shouting. He too was shouting in one corner. Say, these combined services are watering down my ministry. This is somebody that is a... In fact, we have not even confirmed the pastor because we were pastor in training at the time. This is watering down my ministry. Watering down my ministry. You talk with him, my, 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 everywhere. You just see from the language the kind of mentality the guy had. And then his people too were also revolting. You see? Ministry is a dangerous place for an ambitious man. It's not where you come so that you want to get because you want to get noticed, you want to get celebrated and everything. It's not a dangerous place to do that. You can go outside and join PDP, join APC, do all those things, play all those games. The worst kind of politics is church politics. You get involved in it, it's just a matter of time. It will cut you down. It will cut you down. I I have so many bad stories to tell about different people, but I I don't want to say that. I'll just leave that because... I, I, I made up my mind a long time ago. I'm not in the business of saying bad things. So I'll just leave that. If I feel there's a need, I'll mention it. The first thing, first price of discipleship is shove off your ambition. Self-denial. Self-denial. Commit yourself to God. Whatever he wants you to do, let him do. Wherever he wants to take you, let him take you. You know, I've come to see that I heard pastor say many years ago and it didn't really touch me and I've come to see every single day how true it is every single day God gives good things to those that made that make choices God gives good things he said he was telling somebody I heard it I don't know if the lady heard what he said I heard it and I took it many years ago he said God gives good things to those that make choices but God always reserves the best for those that will let him choose for them. God gives good things to those that make choices, but God always reserves the best for those that will let him choose for them. Now that is not to say that you sit back and allow, say, hey, I leave everything for God though. Yes, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. Wherever the guy shows up, the guy that wants to marry you, any first person, Lord, I just close my eyes. 
that the first guy that comes, I will know it's your will. Just open your eyes. If any person may get man greet you, good morning, you know, automatically. That, that is now God that's talking to you. No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is find out the will of God. Approach him for his will. Because I teach people about divine direction. I've come to see that there are different dimensions of divine direction. There's God guiding you. There's God directing you. But I've come to see there's a dimension that's even higher than God directing you. I saw it in the Bible. You know what that direction is? You know what that level is? I said there's a level that is higher than God directing you. You know what it is? Should I tell you? It is God directing your paths. There are two different things. What's the difference? You say, ah, what's the difference between God directing you, God directing your paths? Is he just trying to play on words? No, I'm not playing on words. Let me explain to you. If Pastor Prince wants to go to Biri Biri and he doesn't know the way and he asks me, I'll tell him, okay, this is what you're going to do. Just go down that road. You get to the roundabout. You know, take a left turn or a right turn, whichever way it is. You know, you start heading towards there, towards the road. As you go down, you eventually get to Piri Piri. That is me directing him. But what is now me directing his paths? Because when I direct him, I leave the responsibility of getting there to him. So, I tell him, go there, and I turn. I don't tell him another thing. He can decide to go down there. As he gets there, he says, ah, okay, I think I need to head towards Presco. There's a friend of mine I need to see there. He now turns and begins to head in another direction. But he says, okay, I think I should go to government house. Because though he knows where to go, the distractions are still there. Now, what is directing your path? Okay, a man of God told a story. He landed in a particular airport in a country he had never been before. As he landed in that airport, he was the first person to disembark. This airport was one of the biggest airports he had ever seen. It took him about 30 minutes to get to clear from immigration and everything. But he didn't see anybody to direct him. But he found his way. And he got to where he was going. And so he began to tell us how. He said, at every point in time as you step, you will see the arrow point you to where you should go to. And not just that it points you to where you should go to. Sometimes you find up to three or four doors in a hallway. At every point in time, only the door you should pass through will be open. That is what it means to direct your paths. Where the distractions and the detours are shut down. Because when you direct, if I direct you, the distractions are still there. It's not dependent on, dependent on you to go. Whether you decide, you can decide to change your mind and go in another direction. But in directing your paths, God shuts down all the distractions. At every point in time, you're focused only on where you should be. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about here? Now, that's what the Bible tells us. If you see Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will do what? Direct your path. So it gives us the things that qualify you to be, for God to direct your path. He says, number one is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Implicit confidence. Total reckless abandon. I throw away my will, throw away my ambition, and it is only I'm wrapped in him. I trust him. I know he will not fail me. I might not know where I'm going to. I'm not clear about it, but I'm not supposed to know everything. All I know is that if I follow him, I will not get lost. Simple. You know, it was Don Moen that sang a song. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, his light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. One that touches me most about that song is the reprise. Though I may not understand all the plans he has for me, my life is in your hands. And through the eyes of faith, I can clearly see that God is good. I don't understand all he has for me. 
I don't see beyond, beyond the bend. But I know that if I'm following him, I cannot get lost. That's all. That's all. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's the first thing. He says, number two, lean not on your own understanding. In other words, it doesn't mean you should be stupid. You should you be wise, oh, you're intelligent, oh, but don't depend on that intelligence. Don't depend on that ability. Don't depend on those talents. Don't depend on those resources. Don't depend on the networks you have. Don't depend on your father, your mother, your brothers. No, 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 no. I have somebody that lives, that works in, in, a, in a, a mobile that will get me to Canada. And you've concluded the way your life will go. No. Then he now says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. What does that mean? Anything that God shows up in, where you find him, anything you do, eh? see God inside of him, acknowledge him. Any good thing, thank you, Lord. Tell everybody, it is because of God that this happened. It's not because of me. You see, that's why I keep telling everybody everywhere I go. I'm a product of grace. If you see anything in me that is good, then know it is God. Anything you see that is bad, know it is me. That's the truth. That's the truth. I have an understanding of this. In all your ways, acknowledging him means giving, testifying about the good things he has done for you and in you. Number two, it means that before you embark on anything, find out what he thinks about it. Acknowledge him in that thing. Bring him, get him involved in it. It's so serious that if you get to this point, even before you dress up, you tell him, Holy Spirit, what do you think I should wear? You know, you know I have a pastor. <laughs> I have a pastor in Calabar Church. Dr. Jessam is his name. There's a serious testimony he gave about it. It all began with what he wore. God put in his heart many years ago. He had just left school. I just left, just graduated from university. He didn't have a job, didn't have anything to do. God laid in his heart you know, so the uniform, choir uniform for all the choristers. Because he used to go to Abba. He was living in Portacos. He used to go to Abba to engage in a, you buy some things, do some buying and selling, sewing clothes and all those things. God put said he should sew for all the choristers. He didn't do anything about it until a month later. At the point at which he did it, the last money he had of course, he sold everything for them and gave to them free of charge. You see, because God will wait for you to obey his instruction first. God will not advance instructions beyond your last act of obedience. So he's going to wait for you. So he did that one. He finished doing it. Guess what happened? As he did it, his brother, incidentally, the same week that he decided to go to Abba from Portacot to now buy the thing and so, his brother traveled to Lagos for a wedding. The brother was wearing a suit that he sewed for the brother. As the brother entered that wedding, another person entered the wedding and saw the suit. Liked the suit. Said, ah, I'm going to wear the next month. Where did you buy this? He said, my brother made it for me. He said, can your brother make for my whole, home, whole groom, groom train? The whole train? He said, yes. So the guy ordered 12 suits there and then. Now, he got word. The guy said he should come to Abuja to see. The guy was walking in her way. Got word that he should come to Abuja to come and tidy up the deal. On the day he was to travel from Potakot to Abuja, he had he wore his suit, the suit he made, because he was going to also market. He felt like he might see somebody there that will. So he wore a striped suit. As he wore that striped suit, he was packing. He packed that striped suit. As he was packing his clothes, the Holy Spirit said to him, he said the Holy Spirit told him, you know, there's a, there was a striped shirt. He said the Holy Spirit said, pack that one too. The Holy Spirit said to him, pack that one. He began to argue. He said, Lord, listen, I'm into fashion. I do fashion. It is, you will be arrested by the fashion police for wearing striped suits and striped shirts. That's what a bushman does. 
The Holy Spirit said, put it there. Who knows more fashion than the Holy Spirit? Put it inside the bag. And the guy put it inside the bag. And he went. The next day, he wore it like that, feeling very awkward. Wore the striped shirt and the striped suit. And he walked inside. As he walked, immediately, somebody at the ground floor saw him and said, Hi, I like this shirt. He said, Who are we there? He said, Where did you buy it? He said, ah, If you want it, I can supply. I said, I like this particular shirt, though. I need 10 of them. He was going to see the person that called him home. He said, I need 10 of them. Please get them for me. He said, You will get them. He turned around and walked inside the elevator. As he was going up, lo and behold, the head of the whole corporation, Huawei Nigeria, entered the elevator with him. He said, young man, I like this thing you're wearing now. This is nice. Do you sell them? He said, yes. So the guy now asked, how much do you sell them for? Can you get for me? So he said that he was about to open his mouth to say how much. The Holy Spirit said, shut up. He closed his mouth. The guy continued the conversation. He said, usually, you know, you know, the one I bought for my wedding was 250,000 naira. That's what the guy was telling him. He said, the one I bought for my wedding is 250,000 naira. <laughs> that the other one was another one I bought for 150,000 naira, but I prefer it to the 250,000. Because, you know, the guy was about to open his mouth to tell him 20,000. Hey! The Holy Spirit said, shut up. He shut up. Now, gave him expo on the price he should set. Are you hearing what I'm talking about here? <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm talking about here? <laughs> By the time he was through, the guy ordered five. He built him five. He had not seen the guy he was coming to see yet. And as he pulled him inside, the chairman, the head of the, of the Huawei, was talking to him. Then, as, well, of course, now, a guy has bought now, the boys will want to buy too. So, like three or four other guys that were high ranking, they all surrounded him. Hey, this one that I got bought, you have to buy, but don't give me his price. So don't give me his price. So how much is the thing? How much did he tell you? And I said, just okay, 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 no problem. I'll just do for you seventy, seventy thousand. All of you seventy thousand. And that's how they order two, 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 two like that. He had not seen the guy who was coming to see you. Because you know how this thing started was he was asking God for a car. He didn't have a car. He just graduated from school. Who says that you must even graduate before you have a car? Some people think that you have to stay 10 years before you have a car. I had my first car as a first year student on U- in UNN. First year, stu- first year two, 280, 280 cell. Mercedes Benz 280 cell. My father gave me. I sold it as a seed. Two years later, I got a golf as a student. I was on campus. I passed through my first three cars. Three. On campus, as a campus, as a student in UNN. So nobody says you must wait for that. Is somebody here what I'm talking about? The guy said, from that building he finished, he just went from Abuja straight to Kano to a car shop. Saw one Mercedes Benz coupe that he liked. He said, I want to buy this car. The book is selling. said, ah, you have the money to buy it. He said, how much is it? The guy told him. He just wrote the check. <laughs> and cash Give me my keys. The guy said, with this check, he said, let's go. He went to the bank collected the money. The check did not bounce. The account just balanced. Is somebody here what I'm talking about here? He carried this car and went. You, you, you see, you see, you see eh? one, of the things, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is helping people follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Follow the guidance of God. Because inside being led by the Holy Spirit is every other thing you need. You see that even the first thing the Bible highlights as the benefit of being led by the Holy Spirit is provision. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I follow him. I cannot lack. It begins to list all the things in Psalm 23. You're going to see provision. They see protection. They see all kinds of things inside there. For a person who is holding on to his will has refused to deny, because God cannot fill a full cup. The cup must be empty for him to fill it now. 
That's the, that's the thing John the Baptist was teaching us when he said, I must decrease and that he must do what? Increase. I need to empty myself so that he can take preeminence. That's the way it is. He will not lead you if you're full of yourself. If you have all your ideas, all your plans, all those things, you already know who to marry, then he will leave you to marry the person. You know, the truth of the matter is this. If you even go inside the presence of God to get direction and you're determined about what you want to hear, you will hear it. You will hear that thing you want to hear. You will hear it. And you say it's God that told you. If you've not emptied yourself, it's the truth. Study the Bible. Balaam comes to God. A man called Balak, the king of Moab, said, go and curse the children of Israel. Balaam is a prophet. He knows he shouldn't curse the children of Israel. He said, I will not go. I will not go. You can't curse a man that God has blessed. But they come back again and they put more pressure on him and they increase the fees for prophecy. The consultation fees and the prophetic fees are increased. The guy looks at this thing. He says, now wow. It looks like I need to go here. Who knows? This might be a breakthrough from God. And it's going to cost God's people. He goes to go and pray over what he knows he should not pray about. Lord, shall I go? God says, go. He's going on his way. An angel stands by the roadside with a sword with, ready to kill him. You see, when a person is motivated by his own will, it has a way of blocking even common sense. Because the guy was on his way, riding the donkey. God opened the eyes of the donkey. The donkey saw the angel. The donkey started avoiding the angel. He will move in this direction. Move in this direction. So he started forcing the guy's leg on against the wall. But Balaam was angry. Slapped the donkey. Bah! Stupid donkey, will you move? Donkey now opened his mouth. Why did you slap me now? Why did you slap me now? That was the first time his donkey ever talked to him. Rather than this guy to calm down and listen to the donkey, he began to argue with the donkey. He said, I slapped you because you're misbehaving. The donkey said, Have I ever disobeyed you before? He said, No, you have not disobeyed me. He said, I need to collect my money. You're wasting my time. How a man hears a donkey talking to him and he's still arguing. He was gone. You're full of your own ideas. God will not reach you. Even if he comes down from heaven and talks, you still will not hear. Can you imagine that? You know, finally, you know what happened finally? Finally, Balaam finally went there. Because God opened his eyes to see the angel. And the angel, he warned him. Say, you're lucky. This is your donkey saved you now. You would have reported in hell by now. I've killed you here instantly. That was the one that got him. Fear got him. Finally went back and he now, you know, you know, went and did what? He was even, even when he went there, he even opened his mouth. He was even trying to speak nonsense against them. But the Holy Spirit now came upon him. Because he went there. Balak said, oh, I stand on this mountain and curse them. The guy stood on the mountain. As he opened his mouth to say, to rain curses on them, he started releasing blessings. That your enemies will not find you. That you will escape. And then you will dominate them. You will do this. Bela said, hey, stop that. I called you to curse my enemies. You're blessing them. Is it the location that's the problem? I come to this mountain, this other mountain here. So you curse them from here. The guy climbed the mountain to start cursing. He started releasing blessings. Bela said, ah, I paid you to come and curse my enemies. You're blessing. He said, don't curse again. Don't bless. Don't do anyone. Just come down, come down, come down. You see, when the Bible was talking about it in the New Testament, he said that God forbid the madness of a prophet through the mouth of a donkey. So you see, what I'm trying to make you understand is this. When a person is full of his own desires, eh? if you're full of self, full of self, you are a potent tool in the hands of Satan. I can show you throughout the Bible. Where you eliminate self, you have eliminated Satan. When you, you see, when you finally get married, because I'm sure most of you here are not married, you eventually get married, you're going to notice something. Hmm? And mark what I'm saying for future. I'm talking to you not just by revelation, but by experience. I've been married for 12 years. Hmm? I'm talking to you by experience and by revelation knowledge. 
when you finally get married, you'll notice something. Once you eliminate self, you have closed the door to Satan. In marriage, you eliminate self, you've closed the door to Satan. Totally. You see, when a man and his wife are arguing, 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 somebody must win, somebody must win, the argument is pride. If you lay pride aside, there's nothing Satan can do again. There's no man, for example, or a woman that goes to cheat on their spouse, that cheats on their spouse for the spouse. If a man is sleeping with another woman he's not married to, he's not sleeping with another woman he's not married to for the benefit of his wife. It's for his benefit. If we eliminate things that have to do with our benefit and pursue the benefit of others, we have silenced Satan permanently. Satan walks where he sees self. And once a person is so full of himself, he becomes inured to any direction, any leading from God. You know, look at Jesus now. He gathers his disciples together. One of you will betray me. Everybody's asking, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Judas too come, comes to say, is it I? Lord, is it I? Judas is asking. Greed has possessed the guy. He can see clearly. Judas did not want to kill Jesus. He, did, he, planned, he didn't plan on killing Jesus. He just tried to use him to make money. He felt like, ah, he has seen Jesus several times now. They came to arrest him. One time, they almost pushed Jesus down the cliff. He saw the way Jesus just moved from, disappeared. People are looking for him. Where is this guy? Ah, these signs and wonders has commercial value. Eh? All these guys are not seeing what I'm seeing here. Judas might have been from my village, you know, from Navy. So the guy was busy assessing. How, how do we arrange this thing? You know? I see the way he escaped. I like, just went away and we didn't get any money out of it. Yeah, we can do this thing. You know? The more you look, the less you see. The guy now started his own ministry by the side, his side hustle. The more you look, the less you see limited. And so the guy now went and approached the Pharisees and Sadducees to arrange something sharp, sharp. The plan was that you collect the money. When it's time to kill Jesus, they grab him. Jesus disappears. They will come and meet Judas. Hey, where is the person? He said, why are you asking me? I showed you. You held him. He went. My money is my money. We'll go back. And we'll continue from where we stopped. But they saw, lo and behold, they caught Jesus. They slapped him. Ah, Judas saw. Ah. Give him another slap again. Beat him, beat him, beat him. Ah, it's not what we're back in for. They carried him. It was time to crucify him. They did everything. Sentenced him to death. Ah. I said, this is not the plan. No. This is not what I thought. Carry your money. It was too late. It was too late. Because you see, there are things that blind you to reason. There are things that blind you to revelation knowledge. You can be told, they'll be warning you over time. You have escaped before in the past. You think that this next one will also escape. It happened to Samson. He said, I will just come out as before and shake my head like this. How did Samson get to that point? How did he get to that point? How? A woman comes to him and says, Ah, Samson! Tell me the secret of your power! Samson said, If you tie me with brand new ropes, my power will go. They tied him with brand new ropes. The woman came, shouted, Samson, Samson! The Philistines are, the Philistines are upon you! He got up, tore the ropes, descended on the Philistines, killed all of them. The woman Came back crying. Samson, Samson, you don't love me. If you love me, you will tell me the secret to your power. So I can kill you. Samson now said, okay, if you tie me with cords from the vine, fresh cords, I'll lose my power. The same thing happened again. Samson kept on passing through this ritual without realizing that she was trying to kill him. What happened? What happened? The first key to be led by God is to empty yourself. The first key to discipleship and to be in the center of God's will is self-denial. When I lay all my ambitions, lay my desires, lay everything aside and begin to look at him, what will happen is I'll begin to hear clearly. Okay, number two. Jesus said, take your cross. So, what is taking your cross? The second of discipleship. Hmm? It is a readiness to receive any shame, any betrayal or disappointment for 
for, for Jesus. That's what your cross is. Readiness, readiness to receive any shame, any betrayal, any disappointment for the cause of Christ and for his kingdom, for the advancement of the gospel. A readiness. Whatever it will cost, I will do it. That's what it means to take up your cross. A readiness to pass through any inconvenience to advance the cause of Christ. All I need to know is this, is God involved in this thing? That's the most important thing to me first. If a man is the one that's doing it, that's a different thing. But if it's God, if it's God involved in this one, that's the most important thing to me first. As difficult as it may be, I would need to shelve my plans. Can I hear you tell the story? Can I said he was pastor in a church? And God Almighty said to him, because that particular church was the best church he had ever pastored. They took care of him. Unlike the previous churches he had pastored. He said there's some other churches he pastored before while he was pastoring those churches, that those churches seemed to have a covenant with God. Lord, keep our pastor humble and we'll keep him poor. And so, nothing. He will preach, 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 nothing. But this particular church he got to, these guys had a very powerful understanding of honor and everything. Every year they'll buy him a new car. They'll change his suits, take his wife, everything. They send them on holidays. So he felt like he had entered his permanent site. He had entered ministry. And so this is where we are. We all die here. There's no, no movement again. We're fine. Eh? So, <laughs> and next thing the Holy Spirit said to him, Oga, okay, it's time to move. I bind the devil. He said, don't bind me. Don't mind. I'm not talking to you. It's the Holy Spirit. I said, it's time to move. <laughs> he said, Lord, move where? He said, move out of this church. He said, which church? He said, this church, this one. This one that they're doing me like this. He said, yes, it's time to move. <laughs> he said, Lord, he cried, 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 cried. He said, well, he told his wife. The wife finished binding too, but finally she had to accept. They finished packing their bags. All the while they were crying. Then I decided, okay, let God's will be done. I leave everything in God's hands. Lord, we're happy and we're willing to move. We're ready to move. They packed all their things. They called the U-Haul. The U-Haul is a truck that packs people's things. So they were ready to pack. They had resigned, told the church that they are going. Bye-bye. As they were about to pack their things, the Holy Spirit said, I don't want you to leave. I said, ah. I don't understand. But he said, I should pack now. I don't want you to leave the church. I only want you to be willing to leave the church. Because if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. All I want is a readiness to do my work, my word, to obey me. I'm not, I don't want you to leave the church. I just want you to live in that place where you're detached from it. Detached from everything they give to you. They are not the ones that called you. I'm the one that called you. And that was it. It now dawned on him. So, and whatever it is I'm enjoying now, whatever privileges, are privileges from him. I need to understand that at no point in time should the gift become bigger than the giver. At no point in time. So, I'm willing to sacrifice it, lay everything down. That's the price of discipleship. Leave everything for him. If he puts, points his finger at any point, okay, this is what you want. No problem. Take it, Lord. Whatever it is. That's a requirement. Is there anything that God is giving you that has become bigger than him? Those are things you should ask yourself. You should ask yourself. God passed Abraham through about seven different tests. For example, you have a test of scarcity. When I don't have what it is that God said he's sending my way, will I still be loyal? Will I still be faithful? Will anything change? That's what he did with Job. God passes people through all the same tests. He did it, Job said, even though he slays me, I will yet serve him takes everything away. He's still who he is. He doesn't change anything. He did it with Abraham. Isaac had not shown up. 
Will Isaac, will Abraham still believe in what God said and hold fast to his faith? Abraham took it to another dimension. Changed his name from Abraham to Abraham. I've not seen it yet. The Bible declares, God told me I'm the father of many nations. He put himself up for public ridicule. Because it was one thing that the guy did not have any children at his age. It was another thing that he would now come and start saying to everybody, hey, I am now the father of many nations. At the age of 75, people would look at him and say, hey, oh, wow. Hey, uh, this is affecting this old man. Oh. Say, oh, I will God do this kind of thing now. You know, this guy is a good guy. You know, he doesn't have a child now. They've added madness on top. What kind of thing is this? The guy goes around asking him, Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. At the age of 100, he's still answering Abraham. His wife is 90, Sarah. From Sarai to Sarah, mother of nations. Ah, how? Where? 90-year-old woman. They thought they were crazy. After the test of scarcity is the test of supply. When you now get it, what happens? See the way God came and said to Abraham, years after Isaac was born. He said, give me <laughs> your son. God is something else. He said, give me your son. Your only son. Whom you love. See the categories. I wanted him to enter well. So that Abraham will see. Give me your son. He now reminded him. You've kicked out Ishmael before. So this is your only son. And you love him. So in case you've forgotten. I, was, I know you love him. You love him. Give him. Come and kill him. And bring him to me. Kill him. How does God do such things? That he does it to test commitment. Does it to test commitment. Sometimes it looks like God is harsh. There are some things he does to you sometimes. Eh? A man comes and says, ah, I will follow you. I want to follow you everywhere. I thought you would make it easy for the man. Tell him everything. No, he, says from the, he tells him from the beginning, hey, Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So you know we're squatting from place to place. We're moving around. So don't come and think it's luxury you're entering. You know when we teach people, preach the gospel, sometimes we tell people lies. Come to Christ, your life will be perfect. See, there's work first. God processes you and gets you to that level where you now become a blessing. I will bless you and then you will become a blessing. The process of becoming a blessing is work. In case you don't know. Jesus comes and says to somebody, follow me. The guy says, ah, sir, <laughs> my father is dead though. He said, he was telling the man, his father is dead, his father is dead. He said, the father is dead. He said, he was getting permission, he wants to go and bury his father. Jesus says, hey, let the dead bury their dead. How do you talk to somebody like that? His beloved father is dead. You're telling him, let the dead bury their dead. Sometimes those things happen to test your commitment. Are you really ready for what you say you want? Do you know what you're getting involved in? Willingness to carry your cross. Pass through the pain, pass through the disappointments, pay the price, whatever is required to serve God. You know, when I left the university, I had a job waiting for me. Actually, about four different jobs waiting for me. I had this lady that was working in NMPC then who was already preparing a, a job for me. My friends are working in Oceanic Bank at the time, you know. So I already arranged a banking job for me. Several other opportunities. I could very well have taken those jobs and I won't be here doing what I'm doing today. You see, I discovered a long time ago that not every good gift is a God gift. The fact that it looks good to the eyes doesn't mean it came from God. Am I communicating here? So the most important thing to you is this. At every point in time, having identified what God wants you to do, be willing to focus entirely on it. Give up every other thing. No matter what it costs you. No matter the pain you have to pass through and the inconvenience. Number three. In these three portions of scripture we read, you notice that the third one is followership. 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 
followership. He says, if you're not ready to abandon everything you have and follow me, you're not fit to be my disciple. Followership. This is usually the time of service. You serve on that man that you serve God. If you're convinced that God is here, God has given this man this mandate, you follow him. You follow him. If you're convinced that he hears from God, you follow him. That's what you're supposed to do. You make the work easy for him because by doing so, you're making it easy for yourself. God will reward you on that basis if you're convinced that this is the work. He said, whatever you do, however you work with men, do it unto God. It's God we're serving. Followership. That's the price of discipleship. You don't want to start pursuing saying that, oh, it's only God. I don't, I don't follow any man. I just follow God. It's only God I follow. You're a, re- you're a rebel. You're a rebellion. That's, that's, that's nonsense. Say anywhere, anywhere. I don't have any particular place. So I just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Nonsense. You're a rebellion. I was talking to one guy one time. The guy would tell me about different pastors he has. Who is your pastor? He says, ah, it depends on where I am. Or, you know. uh, in Lagos, my pastor is this person. In Tenugu, my pastor is this one. In this one. I told him you're confused. Highly confused. You're not well. How can a well person be saying that? Say, which family do you belong to? He said, it depends on where I come from. Where, wherever I find myself. When I'm in Lagos, I'm, I'm with the Adegoke family. You know? I've become Adegoke. My name becomes Muiwa Adegoke. And when I get to Enugu, I'm, I, become, I join the Okafo family. My name becomes Nnamdi Okafo, you know? So wherever. See, when I go up north, I, you know, I join the Yusuf family. I become Haruna Yusuf. I, I, what, what do you think of that kind of person? Eh? Yeah? Doesn't he deserve some injections to correct his brain? That's not a normal person. God sets the solitary in families. Sorry. So he puts people, puts them in places. There are different things that God has set as boundaries in divine guidance. What do I mean? Even God Almighty himself has subjected himself to his word. You know, in every name of God is a revelation of an aspect of God. In every name of God is a dimension of the character of God. And the Bible now says God has exalted his word above all his names. So that means that God has placed himself under the check of his word. Implication is that God will never do anything that is not consistent with his word. So you want to know what God is saying. You know, if God is leading, you need to cross-check whatever you think you're hearing with God's word. Also, God also places people under spiritual authority. Nobody can walk outside spiritual authority. It can't happen any person that's telling you, any person you see criticizing fatherhood, attacking, and is a son of Satan. Is a son of Satan. Criticizing, following, leading people, you know, following spiritual leadership is a, is the devil that does that. Satan is, is Satan in manifestation. Whether it's from Ukraine or wherever it is from, it's Satan that's doing that work. Am I communicating here? It's the devil that's doing that work. Satan's philosophy has always been smite. And the sheep will be scattered. He goes for leadership to take it out. That's what he does. You need to understand that when you're functioning. It's Satan. You know what the Bible says? No man takes this honor unto himself. And he that was called of God, as was Aaron was. Eh? Nobody just becomes anointed by himself. There has to be spiritual leadership that confirms that anointing. There has to be somebody you have served before, somebody you followed. You see, that's the confusion now. A lot of people have been having over this this guy, you know, the prophet, 
in so-called prophet in Lagos. There's one guy. I will call his name. You know? Tuberculosis. Hmm? People are confused. They asked him, when did you get born again? He said, he got born again from the womb. How do you get born again from the womb? You follow your process now. We should know who you are. Before you became a prophet, you became a pastor, whatever you are. You served under somebody. You must have served under somebody now. You must have been an usher in the music department somewhere. Who is the person? Nobody. There was nobody he could call. How does that work? Yet you find Jesus. You know what the Bible calls John the Baptist? Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest prophet that ever lived. Ever. He said, of all human beings, born of women, John the Baptist was above every other person. I said, "Ah, how? Why? How is that possible? How come? Did John raise anybody from the dead? Did John multiply bread and fish? You know, Jesus was not the first to multiply food, though. Elijah was multiplying food before him. Elisha was multiplying food before him. Elijah and Elisha were raising dead people. If Elisha was so serious that it was even his bones that were raising dead people. His bones. It was that serious. So how does John the Baptist... The Bible doesn't record that John the Baptist cured a single headache. So how come John the Baptist is now considered superior to Elijah and Elisha? How can he be the greatest? And the Holy Spirit now made me understand something very simple. John had one responsibility. To bear witness of he that was to come. I am not the light. Eh? I am just a voice crying in the wilderness. Make straight the paths of he that is to come. He said, even this guy that's to come, I'm not qualified to un- unlock his shoelaces. But I'm just called to... Ah. Why did John have such a place of prominence? Let me tell you. John had one assignment. Only one. To legitimize the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not a Levite. Even the circumstances of his birth were shrouded in mystery. People were not clear about him. None of his ancestors were prophets. Apart from David, the great prophet who was a king. John the Baptist had a priestly lineage. Everybody knew Zachariah, his father. Everybody knew everything around him. Eh? John the Baptist was a prophet too. Mighty prophet. John said, concerning Jesus, I did not know him more. You know, some people say that Jesus was John's cousin. It's not true. It's not true. I know the place they get that from is when they say uh, Elizabeth was the cousin of uh, Mary. Say, Elizabeth, your cousin. You know, that's what the Bible says. That word cousin there is Sugenes. S-U-G-E-N-E-S. It means king's woman. It means Korako. Doesn't mean that you're related. So John the Baptist had no connection with Jesus. John said, I did not know him. But he that sent me said to me that who upon him, who you see, the Holy Spirit descend as a dove. That is the one. So everybody was following John the Baptist. Everybody knew this guy. Pharisees and Sadducees went to the Jordan to locate him. They knew how powerful this guy was. He was shaking everywhere with his message. Powerful message. People are going around. And then lo and behold, in the eyes of everybody, this other guy comes. Jesus of Nazareth. They baptize him. And he opens. John the Baptist now sees. Ah, the windows of heaven are open now. And the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove upon this guy. He says, ah, John said, I have seen with my eyes and I testify that this is the Son of God. As he made that declaration, one day Jesus was passing. All John's disciples were gathered there. The crowd was gathered there. He said, behold the Lamb of God. His disciples began to follow him. So when I say, ah, your guys are following this man. He said, you don't understand. I must decrease so that he will increase. This is the reason I came. For that reason, 
Because he was showing the pattern. God used him to show the pattern of ministry. Even Jesus Christ will come in the process of baptism. John says, ah! Ah! You are the man. No, 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 no. You should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. Jesus said, hey, you don't understand. Suffer it to be so for now, for thus it becomes to fulfill all righteousness. This is the pattern. And if God Almighty in the flesh will follow the process of mentorship, who are you not to follow? You say that God called you. Who are you subject to? Nobody. You're a rebel. You're a rebel. You're a renegade. And you will end up like Satan if you're not careful. Don't talk, nobody talks to you. Nobody, you, know, you don't fear nobody. You're a dangerous person. Number four, as I begin to round up. Breaking relationships. That's the fourth price of discipleship. Breaking relationships. Breaking relationships. What does that mean? All the relationships that move you away from God's purpose, you need to revisit them. Even if they are family ties. That's what Jesus was saying. Your father is not in support of your faith. What do you do? Does it mean you should dishonor him? No. You should submit. The submission is not an action. Submission is first an attitude. It's an attitude of honor. The Bible doesn't say I should obey my father. It says I should honor him. So at no point in time, even if I disagree with you, I should still be able to honor you. At no point in time will I be putting my fingers in your face and be insulting you or calling you names. I see some people, sometimes, I was talking to one guy the other time. You're a pastor, you were trained by somebody. You've now left, started your own ministry, and you're talking nonsense about where you came from. You will bury yourself. Even if you think there's some advanced revelation you've now received that makes you better or puts you in a better place than the other person. The fact that you are now a grown-up doesn't mean all of a sudden that the person that taught you in secondary school, you should now insult the person. No. If you have sense, you go back and honor that teacher. It was him that laid the foundation of that chemistry or biology that you read and you understood in the university. Am I communicating here? Even if you don't agree with some of the things he was saying, the main foundation is what he laid for you. Somebody now comes and wants to now start your father, you start doing that, you're bigger than you're you're looking for trouble. No. But what the Bible now says is this. Remember, the scripture says to be subject to the higher powers. Subject to the higher authorities. Every authority is meant to end up in God. So, from the child to the father to whoever it is, it keeps moving till it ends in God. That's the way it is. From the child, the mother, and so on and so forth. All forms of authority are supposed to end in God. Now, what the Bible now makes us understand is this. Whenever there is a break in the chain, a break in the link, what you should do is obey the higher power. It doesn't mean you should dishonor the one above you, but obey the higher power. Am I communicating here? You see, every form of leadership, every form of dominion has a sphere within which it operates. In domestic leadership, in domestic government, for example, you have the father, you have the mother, you have the son, the children, right? Your father now gets up and says, Hey, I'm your father. First of all, Buhari declares state of emergency. God forbid. But he declares state of emergency in Abaklike. Nobody goes out. Six to six coffee. The father now waits till 6 20 p.m. What's your name? What's your name? Ben. Stand up, Ben. I say, stand up. Father now comes and says, I'm your father. 
Go outside and buy bread for me. I command you. The Bible says, submit to your father. Go and buy bread. 6.20. Coffee is 6 to 6. He said, ah, okay, my father said that. My father sent me. You now go, go outside to buy. And the soldiers catch you. And of course, they even said that the order that was given to them is shoot on sight. You now come out and say, father sent you. If the soldier is kind, plus you, and that your father, the frog jump people would do. You probably frog jump from here to Ezambo and frog jump back. Because the guy is exercising power he does not have. Think about the governance of Nigeria, for example. Sit down. Buhari says, I am the president of Nigeria. And he crosses over to Cameroon. As if inside Cameroon. He now says, policeman, arrest that guy, arrest that guy. Does he have the power to do that? Imagine that you go to New York. As you're driving, you drive past. Cross a place as you pass. Lasma now comes out in New York. You know Lasma? You know Lasma? Or road safety. They come and say, hey, hey, hey. Pack, 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 pack. In a light. <laughs> he, 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 said, he said he will beat them. I will fold you and put inside my boots. I will fold you put inside my boots. Because every dominion has jurisdictions. You need to be able to locate the jurisdiction of the dominion you, you function under. Once that dominion surpasses its jurisdiction, you disregard it. Honor it, but disregard it. Am I communicating here? Honor it, but disregard it. How do I honor but disobey? Nebuchadnezzar comes and says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, bow down and worship me. If not, I throw you inside this place. The boys come down and they bow and say, Sir, we honor you. They are O king. You see, by this one, we will not do it, sir. Don't be offended, though, but we will not do it. See, if you throw us inside this place, eh, we will not honor you. We will not bow down to this, your God. If you change your mind about throwing us inside there, we still will not bow down to this, your God. So you see how respectfully they said it. The fact that you disagree with someone doesn't mean you're not start challenging the person. Start exchanging. Yeah. So, any relationship that leads you out of God's purpose for your life, you need to reevaluate. That's the first thing I want you to understand here. Number four, or five, 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 as I round up. The fifth price of discipleship is breaking attachment to material possessions. Breaking attachment to material possessions. You keep on saying that over and over again. Over and over again. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 from verse 23. Mark chapter 10 from verse 23. You have that? Put it up for me. Mark 10. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, with what difficulty will those who possess wealth and keep on holding it enter the kingdom of God? Verse 24. And disciples were amazed and bewildered and perplexed at his words. Give me, give me New King James first. Give me New King James. Go back to verse 23. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to, no, to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it is. Look at the next verse. 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words. You know why they were shocked? Some of them were rich while others were planning to be rich. You know, So, ah, how can you say that? person that has riches is going to be difficult. And that, is this not what we're bagging for? Is it, is it Oyahu that we're coming to do here? You know what they call Oyahu? Oyahu is soft ahead. NYSC. Now your suffering commences. Eh? So is this what we're coming to follow you to do here? Jesus said, hey, let me explain to you. Jesus answered again. 
how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. The issue is not having it. The issue is having confidence in it. That's what, that's what the Bible calls the deceitfulness of riches. Riches can be deceptive. Are, are you aware? Very deceptive. Let, let, me, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever been hungry before? Let me see your hands. You've ever been hungry before? Lift up your hands. If ever, ever in your life you have ever been hungry before. If you have ever been hungry before, look around you, see the person who is not raising his hand. The person either doesn't understand what I'm saying or the person needs hands laid on him to cast out the demon of lies. You have ever in your life been hungry before? You have never been hungry. You wear glasses. But your hand is up now. Okay. Put your hands down. How many of you have, have been hungry before and then all of a sudden a certain amount of money entered your account? <laughs> and as the money entered your account, you got the alert. The hunger went. As you have not eaten no, but the hunger disappeared. Has it happened to you before? <laughs> now you know what I'm talking about. That's the deceitfulness of riches. <laughs> <laughs> as the deceitfulness of riches that's what because you see there's something that money putting confidence in money does to you you know there's a level of confidence you have if you have money you, you, know, you, know, you know if you don't have money in your pocket there's a way you walk when you're walking on the road you shift to the side of the road and you're walking like this eh? because you don't want to collide with somebody selling eggs and when the egg falls, you start speaking English. And start communicating in grammar. You want to now bamboozle the girl. You start saying, saying what, you know, I'm, 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 highly, I'm highly penitent over, <laughs> over, uh, <laughs> you know, this, this misadventure. You know, it, it was not, it was not my intention to be, you know, if you speak in the English, you, you have to empty your pocket. You see, but, when you have money in your pocket, you walk on the, in the middle of the road. You're walking in the middle of the road. Just middle, middle. You're just walking like this. You spread yourself like this. You're just walking like this. You're walking like this. So when the, the car, a car is behind, is blowing. Pee, 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 pee. Come out from the road. You say, hey, my friend, you know who you're talking to? Be careful there. Be careful there. If you're hungry, I'll buy you food. What is that? You see, that's deceitfulness of riches. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. It's that confidence that money gives you. That's what Jesus Christ was trying to talk about. How hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Look at the next verse. He says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Have you explained to them what this verse means? You know, that gate in Jerusalem, not just in Jerusalem, but in all those cities in the Middle East in those days, there are gates of cities. Now, for security purposes, the city gates were closed at certain times. But because there were merchants that would walk all day, maybe coming from a very far location at night, and they are carrying their camels with goods and everything, they created another door in the gate called the Eye of the Needle. So, once you come at the time where the gate is locked and the person identifies himself as an inhabitant of that place, they open the eye of the needle for him to pass. Because why they open only the eye of the needle is that they won't open the whole gate now. If they open the whole gate, they don't know if somebody has put a gun or a knife to the guy's neck. So they open the gate. Everybody now rushes in to come and invade the city. So it's just that guy. So, in order to pass through the eye of the needle, they open it. He can walk past. But the camel needs to go down on his knees and then strip itself of everything it's carrying and then crawl through the eye of the needle. After it has crawled, then they can pull all the things after it. What Jesus is saying is this. Riches should go hand in hand with humility. 
you bow down. As you bow down, you offload all the things that you have confidence in and pass through the kingdom of God. You know, when you see the 24 elders, the Bible says, as the 24 elders are worshipping God, the first thing they did was to cast their crown before him. Number one. And then they bowed down and worshipped him. That's what it is. So, you are meant to own possessions. Possessions are not meant to own you. That's the difference. That's the difference. Of all the cars I've ever driven, of everything I've ever owned, I have never sold anyone. It's just one time I sold. One time I sold. And that one time I sold was my power bike. I sold my bike. And I carried that money and put it inside the account meeting project. That's the only time I ever sold anything that belonged to me. I sold it because I couldn't give the bike. Now I won't give the bike. I'm a biker. I have an idea how much bikes will cost and how much I was willing to do that. I paid for it. I mean, sold it, put the money inside. Other than that, all the cars I've ever driven, I've given out. All the clothes I've ever won, I've given out. I have not sold a pin to anybody. I have not sold a pin to anybody. I'm not saying if you do the same thing. It's my own understanding. Once I get a car, the first thing that comes to my mind is, Lord, I don't know how long I have to drive this. But when, I, when you show me the owner, let me know. Let me know the owner of this car so I can give the right person. I don't want to give you know, wrong people. Show me the fertile ground you've designed for this car to go to. Because I am a steward and not the owner. Whatever I have with me does not belong to me. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So let the man who owns everything tell me what to do with his property. If my life doesn't belong to me, is it my car that belongs to me? Huh. I've so detached myself to the point that if something bad happens to any of if God forbid the car gets burnt or something, it won't, shake, it won't change anything. It won't shake me. It won't shake me. I'm telling you the truth. God knows. One day, my car, I told you about it, the car that got burnt. <laughs> the Mercedes Benz Jeep. I was inside this because I had packed it. I traveled. I went to America with my family. I came back. For, by the time we got back, I had been away for a long period of time. The car had parked. And you know, you know, there was a period in that Lagos Island. Eh? Rats. I don't know where those guys, especially there were empty plots. There were empty plots beside my house. Yeah. That must have been where they came from. And there was no activity. So these rats descended on this car, chewed up all the wires inside. When I opened inside, as I opened inside, I called my security, security man to clean up the car. Rat urine, rat feces everywhere. I didn't, it didn't dawn on me that I should not start that car. I was feeling the nudge not to start the car, but there was a program I needed to rush for. I put the key, started the car, and drove away after the guy cleaned it up. As I parked the car in headquarters, we were in a program. Pastor was preaching. Next thing they were calling me. I should come, 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 come. What is it? I went outside. My car was on fire. Because these demonic rats had chewed up the bridge. So the current kept on moving. The thing that should have stopped the current, you know, the current kept on moving and sparked the fire. He called me. The car had burnt up. What I was interested in was the documents inside the car. My children's passports, American passports, my passport and some other things. Please break open the glass and bring it for me. That was, people were shocked. Some of the guys were looking at me, they were surprised. Ah. And they thought this guy would be fainting or dying that this guy is burning. See, for me, a car is like a pen. The pen. I write, I give you, you write. Simple, what is that? There's no big deal there. We end up worshipping nonsense. Worshipping things that should not be worshipped. We make big things out of them. You see, a man of God believes he has arrived because he has one car. What is that? You come and share testimony. To Kumbo that the white man has finished driving, driving. He has rocked it, rocked it, rocked it. You now say, brethren, praise the Lord. God has given me. What is that? You should be ashamed of yourself. What kind of testimony is that? Somebody finishes giving, using a handkerchief. He cleans his face. He now gives you. Say, ah, brethren, praise the Lord. I have a new hanky. What is that?
break attachments to those things. Is someone hearing what I'm talking about here? Break attachments to those things. Attachments. Okay, first of all, put your hand on your chest, everybody. We need to pray concerning this. You, you know why? You know why this is important? Why you should pray concerning this? See, I studied the Bible. <laughs> eh? I'm here to find any other spirit that Jesus calls a master. Even Satan, he did not call master. Even Beelzebub, he did not call master. But he said, no man can serve two masters at the same time. You either serve God or you serve Mammon. He called Mammon a master. Mammon is the spirit behind money. Mammon is so deadly, in my opinion, it's deadlier than Satan. You know why? Mammon is the only thing that actually contends with God for the souls of men. Nobody will see Satan here and come and join him unless something is wrong with the person. So you see Beelzebub here, you come and rush and join Beelzebub. But Mammon is reaping a har- harvest every day. Mammon collected Judas. Entered Jesus Christ CEC and collected one guy. That's not a small boy now. Not even fornication did that job. Mammon did it. Religion could not do it. Mammon did it. In case you don't know. Anyway, put your hand on your chest. Talk, begin to pray. Open your mouth. Begin to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, help me. My connection to material things, my connection to material things, help me, correct me, help me, help me. Whatever needs to be done on the inside of me, help me. Help me, Lord, please. Help me. Help me. Break every attachment. Break every attachment. In Jesus' name. Two times you find in the New Testament where covetousness is mentioned. eh? Covetousness is the only sin that is qualified. What do I mean? Let me show you. We're still praying or we're not true. I want to show you how serious this matter is. Covetousness is the only sin that is qualified. Let me explain what I mean. Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. Let's read it together. Want to go. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You see, you have to now define covetousness. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Okay, let's read it together. Everybody want to go. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Can you see that? It doesn't qualify fornication. does not qualify uncleanness doesn't qualify all these other things. He tells us, he goes further to explain to us what covetousness is. You know, covetousness is greed. He now says that the greedy man is an idolater, is an idol worshiper. It's not only when you go to Google Okija. Alo see Okija. There you're worshiping idols. When you paint your eye with chalk and throw cola nuts. A lot of people are idol worshippers in church. There are bigger idol worshippers than the guys that you find worshiping Shongo. And Amadio. Yes. Bigger idol worshippers. That's why in the east of Ni- eastern Nigeria, idolatry is saturated everywhere. It's idolatry that's holding us now because of the love for mammon. It calls it idol worship. Every greedy man is guilty of idolatry. Every greedy man. Because you're worshipping money. Begin to pray. Put your hand on your chest. Bow down and begin to pray. And begin to talk to God. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, deliver me from idolatry. 
Deliver me from idolatry. Help me. Deliver me from idolatry. Help me in the name of Jesus Christ. Deliver me from idolatry. Heavenly Father, please help us. Help us, Heavenly Father. Correct whatever needs to be corrected. Correct whatever needs to be corrected. Help us, mighty God. Shelela Musa Katiala Mondoro Bosha Bradala Boya Sede de Andala Gashadidi. Father, correct whatever needs to be corrected. Help us in the name of Jesus. Mungosha Baba Mangodoro Gosha Bradara Baya Tadema Mandere Baya Sede de Dima. Nusamandala Bosha Bragadara Baya Tere de Dima. Zamangadala Gosha Mama Mama Mangodoro Gosha Mama Mama Dara Baya. Father, forgive me, O Lord. Purify me. Cleanse me, O Lord. Cleanse me, O Lord, and help me. Selele mo shalala ya la la la. Gandere bo shire ya tele mo ndolo bo shibradi. Selele bo shibrakada. Cure me, O Lord. Save me, O Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. We believe you've been transformed by the wonders of God's Word. For additional information about us, you can visit our website at www.princetonhills.org. You can also send us a mail at info at princetonhills.org or call 070-331-66762 or 081-31-555. 747. Princeton Hills Ministries, raising global, global leaders. Global leaders.